Hello welcome to Best Movies channel. In this video, I introduce Citizen Kane, the greatest film ever made, so stay with me. Citizen Kane is a 1941 American drama film directed by, produced by, and starring Orson Welles. Welles and Herman J. Mankiewicz wrote the screenplay. The picture was Welles' first feature film. Citizen Kane is frequently cited as the greatest film ever made. For 50 consecutive years, it stood at number one in the British Film Institute's sight and sound decennial poll of critics. And it topped the American Film Institute's 100 years. 100 movies list in 1998, as well as its 2007 update. The film was nominated for Academy Awards in nine categories and it won for Best Writing by Mankiewicz and Wells. Citizen Kane is praised for Greg Toland's cinematography, Robert Wise's editing, Bernard Herrmann's music, and its narrative structure. All of which have been considered innovative and precedent-setting. The quasi-biographical film examines the life and legacy of Charles Foster Kane, played by Wells, a composite character based on American media barons William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Chicago tycoons Samuel Insull and Harold McCormick, as well as aspects of the screenwriter's own lives. Upon its release, Hearst prohibited the film from being mentioned in his newspapers. After the Broadway success of Wells's Mercury Theatre and the controversial 1938 radio broadcast, The War of the Worlds, on the Mercury Theatre on the air, Wells was courted by Hollywood. He signed a contract with RKO Pictures in 1939. Although it was unusual for an untried director, he was given freedom to develop his own story, to use his own cast and crew, and to have final cut privilege. Following two abortive attempts to get a project off the ground, he wrote the screenplay for Citizen Kane, collaborating with Herman J. Mankiewicz. Principal photography took place in 1940, the same year its innovative trailer was shown, and the film was released in 1941. Although it was a critical success, Citizen Kane failed to recoup its costs at the box office. The film faded from view after its release, but it returned to public attention when it was praised by French critics such as André Bazin and re-released in 1956. In 1958, the film was voted number 9 on the prestigious Brussels 12 list at the 1958 World Expo. Citizen Kane was selected by the Library of Congress as an inductee of the 1989 inaugural group of 25 films for preservation in the United States National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. In a mansion called Xanadu, part of a vast palatial estate in Florida, the elderly Charles Foster Kane is on his deathbed. Holding a snow globe, he utters his last word, Rosebud, and dies. A newsreel obituary tells the life story of Kane, an enormously wealthy newspaper publisher and industrial magnate. Kane's death becomes sensational news around the world, and the newsreel's producer tasks reporter Jerry Thompson with discovering the meaning of Rosebud. Thompson sets out to interview Kane's friends and associates. He tries to approach his second wife, Susan Alexander Kane, now an alcoholic who runs her own nightclub, but she refuses to talk to him. Thompson goes to the private archive of the late banker Walter Parks Thatcher. Through Thatcher's written memoirs, Thompson learns about Kane's rise from a Colorado boarding house and the decline of his fortune. In 1871, gold was discovered through a mining deed belonging to Kane's mother, Mary Kane. 
she hired Thatcher to establish a trust that would provide for Kane's education and assume guardianship of him. While the parents and Thatcher discussed arrangements inside the boarding house, the young Kane played happily with a sled in the snow outside. When Kane's parents introduced him to Thatcher, the boy struck Thatcher with his sled and attempted to run away. By the time Kane gained control of his trust at the age of 25, the mine's productivity and Thatcher's prudent investing had made Kane one of the richest men in the world. Kane took control of the New York Inquirer newspaper and embarked on a career of yellow journalism, publishing scandalous articles that attacked Thatcher's and his own business interests. Kane sold his newspaper empire to Thatcher after the 1929 stock market crash left Kane short of cash. Thompson interviews Kane's personal business manager, Mr. Bernstein. Bernstein recalls that Kane hired the best journalists available to build the Inquirer's circulation. Kane rose to power by successfully manipulating public opinion regarding the Spanish, American War and marrying Emily Norton, the niece of the President of the United States. Thompson interviews Kane's estranged best friend, Jedediah Leland, in a retirement home. Leland says that Kane's marriage to Emily disintegrated over the years, and he began an affair with amateur singer Susan Alexander while running for governor of New York. Both his wife and his political opponent discovered the affair, and the public scandal ended his political career. Kane married Susan and forced her into a humiliating operatic career for which she had neither the talent nor the ambition even building a large opera house for her. After Leland began to write a negative review of Susan's disastrous opera debut, Kane fired him but finished the negative review and printed it. Susan protested that she never wanted the opera career anyway, but Kane forced her to continue the season. Susan consents to an interview with Thompson and describes the aftermath of her opera career. She attempted suicide, and so Kane finally allowed her to abandon singing. After many unhappy years and after being hit by Kane, she finally decided to leave him. Kane's butler Raymond recounts that, after Susan left him, he began violently destroying the contents of her bedroom. When he happened upon a snow globe, he grew calm and said Rosebud. Thompson concludes that he cannot solve the mystery and that the meaning of Kane's last word will remain a mystery. Back at Xanadu, Kane's belongings are catalogued or discarded by the staff. They find the sled on which eight-year-old Kane was playing on the day that he was taken from his home in Colorado and throw it into a furnace with other items. Behind their backs, the sled slowly burns in its trade name, printed on top, becomes visible through the flames, Rosebud. And it's interesting to know about filming. Production advisor Miriam Geiger quickly compiled a handmade film textbook for Wells, a practical reference book of film techniques that he studied carefully. He then taught himself filmmaking by matching its visual vocabulary to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which he ordered from the Museum of Modern Art, and films by Frank Capra, René Clair, Fritz Lang, King Vidor and Jean Renoir. The one film he genuinely studied was John Ford's Stagecoach, which he watched 40 times. As it turned out, the first day I ever walked onto a set was my first day as a director, Wells said. I'd learned whatever I knew in the projection room from Ford. After dinner every night for about a month, I'd run stagecoach, often with some different technician or department head from the studio, and ask questions. How was this done? Why was this done? It was like going to school and interesting to know about movie reviews. Film scholars and historians view Citadel
is in Kane as Wells' attempt to create a new style of filmmaking by studying various forms of it and combining them into one. However, Wells stated that his love for cinema began only when he started working on the film. When asked where he got the confidence as a first-time director to direct a film so radically different from contemporary cinema, he responded, ignorance, ignorance. Sheer ignorance you know there's no confidence to equal it. It's only when you know something about a profession, I think, that you're timid or careful. David Bordwell wrote that, the best way to understand Citizen Kane is to stop worshipping it as a triumph of technique. Bordwell argues that the film did not invent any of its famous techniques such as deep focus cinematography, shots of the ceilings, chiaroscuro lighting, and temporal jump cuts and that many of these stylistics had been used in German Expressionist films of the 1920s, such as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. But Bordwell asserts that the film did put them all together for the first time and perfected the medium in one single film. In a 1948 interview, D.W. Griffith said, I loved Citizen Kane and particularly loved the ideas he took from me, Arguments against the film's cinematic innovations were made as early as 1946 when French historian Georges Seydoux wrote. The film is an encyclopedia of old techniques. He pointed out such examples as compositions that used both the foreground and the background in the films of Augusta and Louis Lumiere. Special effects used in the films of Georges Méliès shots of the ceiling in Eric von Stroheim's Greed and newsreel montages in the films of Gigi Averdov. And finally, I hope you will see this movie completely and enjoy watching it. I would be happy if you could comment your opinion about this movie.